to the Wild World of Bees, an online lecture series brought to you by the Project. I'm getting feedback. The Oregon Bee Project is a collaboration between the Oregon Department of Forestry, the Oregon Department of Agriculture, and Oregon State University Extension Service. And we are proud to present Mr. August Jackson, the interpretation coordinator at Mount Pisgah Arboretum in Eugene, Oregon. And he will be talking about Oregon's cuckoo bees this evening. As part of the Oregon Bee Project, uh, we have an initiative to study the biodiversity of native bees in Oregon through the Oregon Bee Atlas. And this program is intended to train and equip citizen scientists to create an inventory of the state native bee fauna and their floral preferences, to educate Oregonians on the state's bee biodiversity, and to conduct ongoing surveys of native bee populations in order to assess their health. Through the Oregon Bee Atlas, this year in 2020, we've launched the Master Melatologist Program. And this program is designed to train up our volunteers to become proficient at generating museum quality native bee species occurrence data. And if you're interested in becoming a Master Melatologist, you can find us online through the OSU Extension Service and add your name to the waiting list to join the Master Melatologist program and learn all about the biodiversity of native bees. So welcome August. Oh, I was muted. <laughs> what I said is <laughs> it's for Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. i um, excited to be here to do this, um, and thanks for putting it together. Uh, so let me pull up my screen here and we'll get started. Um, yeah, and thank you for the introduction, Link. So um, as Link said, I'm the interpretation coordinator at Mount Pisgah Arboretum in Eugene, Oregon. We're a 209 acre nature education facility that um, does a lot of <clears throat> different uh, varieties of nature education, all of which at this point are on hold. So we're kind of shifting things into um, the virtual arena um, and uh, was excited to join in with this as kind of a part of that effort. Um, and then I know a lot of you and you know a lot of me as well through the um, Oregon Bee Atlas. Um, so I've been an instructor with the Oregon Bee Atlas, I guess the last two years or so, and hopefully we'll be able to run that um, bee school again this summer. Um, but you know, it's all wait and see with things like that. Uh, so let me pull up my controls here. Fancy laser pointer, get that ready. All right. So um, basic outline here is we're just gonna look at, we're gonna start um, at a very basic level, look at what are kleptoparasitic bees. We'll take a quick look at the phylogeny, so kleptoparasitic lineages, and then the different modes of kleptoparasitism, including uh, social parasites, which are not true kleptoparasites, but super interesting um, and kind of fit into this world of bee parasitism. And we'll also look at the prevalence of kleptoparasitism, both as an evolutionary strategy and um, in terms of their numbers in the environment, um, and look at their ecological role. Um, their pollination services, and then also the effect that they play on limiting um, bee populations and having an effect thereby on species richness. Um, and then we'll take a close look at some of these bees with a lot of big pictures. So the first part is gonna be a little uh, more heavy on um, kind of concepts. And then we'll just jump into looking at pictures of um, some of the common genera here. Um, and then at the very end, we'll take a quick look at some non-bee parasites that are really common in our area that are um, pretty fun. Not fun for the bees, but fun for you and me. Let's see. Oh, why can't I move forward now? There we go. 
So what is kleptoparasitism? Um, broadly, the term just refers to the stealing of food or other objects from um, another individual. So we see a lot of parasitism of this sort in birds. Um, bald eagles, for example, are major kleptoparasites. A lot of their food comes from stealing from other animals. Um, and then of course we have locally uh, cowbirds, brown-headed cowbirds, which lay their eggs in the nest of other birds and have those birds raise their young. Um, so that's a little bit more like uh, kleptoparasitism in the bee world. Of course, you don't have bees flying around and attacking other bees and pulling their pollen off of their body. Um, what you have instead is bees who um, break into or sneak into the nests of other bees and then lay their eggs in these provision nests um, so that their young can develop on um, the already gathered pollen and nectar um, or floral oils. Um, and there's also a lot of murder involved in that. Uh, so here we're looking at a picture of an Andrina mining bee um, nest entrance. And so these are a really common target of some of our kleptoparasitic bee species. This one was actually hidden underneath an oak leaf. Um, so sometimes they go through a little effort maybe to kind of um, make it a little more confusing where, you know, a, the, the scents are coming from if um, something like a nomada is tuned into uh, a bee's scent. Uh, so this is my favorite slide in the whole thing, and it looks a little intimidating, um, but it's actually really cool. Um, so I'll break it down really quickly. Um, and this is just a phylogenetic tree of... Um, kleptoparasitic lineages, particularly, particularly in the long-tongued bees, which are the apidae, which are honeybees and bumblebees and digger bees and things like that, and the uh, megachylidae, which are our uh, mason bees and leafcutter bees, etc. cetera. Um, so I'll highlight this with the fancy laser pointer. Um, what's really interesting here is you have this giant group of kleptoparasitic bees this huge clade that all starts from a single ancestor um, that includes the nomadinae and the molectini. Um, and this just includes a really massive chunk of the apid kleptoparasites. But then you also have a lot of other kleptoparasitic lineages developing. So it looks like there are about four different origins of kleptoparasitism in the apidae. And then if we go to the other side, it's the megachylidae. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six different kleptoparasitic lineages. The biggest group are the Stelis over here. Um, and we'll take a good look at the Stelis clade. Um, a little more detail, which we'll jump into in just a second. Uh, this color coding is based on the mode of parasitism. So closed cell or open cell parasitism. And you can see that closed cell, at least in this group was basal and then moved into more open cell paras parasitism. We'll talk about what that means, if I remember right, just on the next slide. Yeah, so closed cell kleptoparasitism is when an adult bee breaks into a nest that's already been closed. So the cell has been provisioned, an egg has been laid, and then an adult bee breaks in. And there's adult closed cell kleptoparasitism and larval closed cell kleptoparasitism. And the only difference between those two is who kills the existing egg or larvae, whether it's the adult that does it or it's the kleptoparasitic larva that does it once it hatches out. Um, so a lot of kleptoparasitic larvae are um, uh, pretty highly evolved with these bizarre mandibles that are used for killing um, the existing larvae or egg, depending on the timing in which they hatch out. Open cell parasitism is different um, in that the cell is still open. It's probably in the act of being provisioned um, or maybe you know, really just starting with the provisions. And this, in this um, mode, you have the kleptoparasitic bee sneak into the cell and try to get out without getting caught. They'll lay an egg. And since that egg from the host bee has not already been laid or there's no existing larvae um, to kill, it's all on the kleptoparasitic larvae that hatches to kill um, the existing larva. So um, kind of three different modes there in the sense that you have adult closed cell and larval closed cell, and then you have um, larval open cell parasitism. And when we go through each of the genera, um, I've included on the side uh, which mode they use. 
um, just as kind of a uh, point of interest. Um, we won't really talk about it much further, but I think it's interesting to know that there are different ways um, that kleptoparasitic bees approach that kind of attack of the nest. Um, and then we have social parasitism, which is um, completely different and involves um, social species like bumblebees um, and some of our social holictines. So some of the um, species in the genus Holictus. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more kind of once we dig into the genera, uh, but that's um, pretty interesting and even more wicked in a lot of ways. And this is a bumblebee, one of our um, socially parasitic bumblebees, Bombus insularis. So the prevalence of kleptoparasitic lineages is super impressive. An estimated 13% um, of all species are cuckoo bees, and that's worldwide. Um, in certain areas, that percentage seems to be quite a bit higher. Um, and this includes about 20% of all aphid species. So again, the family containing the bumblebees, honeybees, digger bees, things like that. That entire family, about 20% are kleptoparasites. So um, a pretty successful uh, life strategy. Uh, kleptoparasitism has evolved independently 15 to 20 times. We saw those 10 different times when looking at the long-tongued bees, um, but it's also evolved frequently in um, the uh, helictid bees, so the sweat bees, and has evolved um, at least once in uh, the Caledidae, in um, uh, the endemic Hawaiian hylius or masked bee species. Um, so pretty interesting transition to kleptoparasitism there. And there are probably other lineages that we don't yet know about. Um, Really interesting thing about these bees is despite all these numerous origins, they all share a suite of characters, kind of all evolutionarily converged on um, a suite of characters. So they don't have hairs, uh, specialized hairs for gathering or transporting pollen. So um, they tend to be a lot less hairy than their hosts. Um, they have simplified mandibles because they don't need to um, construct a nest. Um, and they tend to have um, some often uh, kind of modified antennae, potentially for um, picking up on um, chemical cues of their hosts. And then, of course, um, they have really uh, thickened um, integument to try to resist attacks from the host species if they're caught in the nest. So um, some of you have probably pinned some of these kleptoparasitic bees before, and you've likely noticed that you have to try a lot harder to get a pin through the thorax of a kleptoparasitic species. They have a really dense integument, and that's partly to withstand attacks um, from, from host bees when they're invading a nest. And then of course, as I mentioned before, their um, larvae are different as well, in that they're equipped with a pair of mandibles um, in the first larval stage to kill the existing egg or um, larva that's in the nest cell. This is Zeromelecta californica, uh, one of my favorite cuckoo bees that we have here in Oregon. You'll find it in some of the drier sites. We'll look at it again in a little bit. Um, so their ecology is really interesting as well. Um, some of the kleptoparasites are among the rarest bee species in the world. And that's because by nature they have um, they're, they're, they just exist at lower densities than their host species. So if we think of these as predators, predators are always um, in lower numbers than their prey species will ever be. Um, so by nature, they're going to be less common. Uh, sometimes as a group, you know, for example, um, right now in the Willamette Valley, uh, that, um, you know, pretty intact natural areas, you'll find just hordes of nomada out and about. And that's because we have a ton of andrina that are flying right now. Um, so they'll look as a whole group to be um, pretty abundant sometimes, but as separate individual species, they're always going to be existing at uh, much lower levels in the environment. Um, so finding these kleptoparasitic species coming across them um, is something that happens a lot less frequently than uh, the rest of the bees that you, know, you might be out collecting. Uh, so this is a dioxys species here, um, and those are one of the um, really infrequently encountered kleptoparasites in our area. Um, I see them a couple times a year, max. 
So they're definitely not as good at pollinating as um, the average other female bee is going to be. And that's just because they don't have hairs for intentionally gathering pollen um, and transporting pollen. And also because they're not working at all on provisioning a nest. So they are not visiting flowers for their young. They'll only be visiting flowers for themselves. So their uh, frequency of flower visitation is going to be a lot lower than the average other female bee. Of course, the males, um, it's going to be fairly similar. There aren't going to be a, an extraordinary amount of differences between the um, effectiveness of males, um, but they are still pretty good pollinators. Uh, we see them visiting flowers a lot. And as you can see on the Celioxus male, he's definitely carrying a good amount of pollen grains, um, enough to serve as, a, as an important pollinator. So I think it's important to recognize that, you know, um, while these species are, um, parasites and you tend to look at parasites particularly on bees as kind of a negative thing um, they're definitely performing pollination services and then they um, serve a really important ecological role which I'll jump into now and that's that they affect sort of a top-down control on bee pollinations so they're sort of at the apex of bee communities and frequently kleptoparasites will be targeting some of the most abundant bees in a community so um, often um, they're going to be going after the most common Andrina species or the most common Halicta species um, or the most common uh, Melitta species, um, which is usually only one in one place. But um, they tend to target the really abundant species. And in doing that, um, by checking those populations, keeping them in control, um, they're potentially opening up uh, resources for other less common bees, particularly some that occupy some of the same um, niches in the floral community, um, and thereby actually raising um, the species richness in, uh, in, in a given area. Um, so this has been tested a few times, um, and there was an interesting paper um, which looked at kleptoparasites as sort of indicator taxa for the health of bee communities and as potentially a way to actually measure the health of bee communities just by sampling the kleptoparasitic taxa. Um, so it's an interesting um, possibility. It hasn't really been tested much beyond um, this initial paper, but because kleptoparasites are more sensitive to um, disturbance, they're more susceptible generally to local extinction. So where you have um, intensive agriculture, uh, you tend to see kleptoparasites disappear first before their hosts. Um, and so these are early signs of uh, disturbances in the environment that may end up having broader effects on the bee community. Um, so really interesting uh, potential here to look at kleptoparasites as um, indicators for community health. This is a Stela species, and if we're talking about community health, a lot of these photos that I'm showing here all come from the same place, and it's, you know, one of the healthiest bee communities I've um, encountered, and uh, these are kind of a, a testament to that. So now we'll just jump into um, a look at some of the genera. This is a Triepiola species, so these tend to be parasitic on anthophorine bees and um, bees in the Tribucerini, so the longhorn bees, Melisodes, and I guess Eucera, although I never see these at the same time as Eucera are out, but um, who knows. So first we're going to start with the social parasites. Um, so this is Bombus insularis here, they're in the subgenus Cytheris. And social parasitism is um, really interesting. What happens is you have a, um, queen is not the correct term, the technical term, but we'll use it anyway, um, just for the sake of simplicity. So you have this parasitic queen that will end up going into an existing nest of another bumblebee species that is already at a point where there are a lot of healthy workers um, bringing in a lot of nectar and pollen resources to raise um, more workers, and then the reproductive castes. So these parasitic queens will go in and they will um, essentially dominate the existing queen. Um, they will either kill her or um, just kind of uh, bully her into releasing control of the workers. And this new parasitic queen um, controls those workers 
and forces um, those workers to continue to provide resources, pollen and nectar, and support her young, which will only be reproductive. So other females like herself and males. So pretty um, incredible uh, par mode of parasitism um, and one that we also see in some of the spicotes. So some spicotes are known to be social, social parasites in the nests of other holictine bees um, that are social. Uh, the interesting thing is you also have spicotes species that are just regular kleptoparasites in non-social species. So they're, these are both social parasites and adult closed cell parasites. So they break into cells that have already been closed. Um, for those that are true kleptoparasites, their hosts are kind of all over the place, but they tend to be in the same family, in the Holictidae, or in the Coletidae, which are the plaster bees, the polyester bees, the masked bees, um, although I don't suspect that these have anything to do with masked bees. Um, and then also the Andrina day, which are the mining bees. And after each of these, when I have photos, I'll just show a couple of photos of them kind of out in the real world um, so you can get a feel for what they look like. Um, these really run the gamut in size from tiny, about the size of some of the uh, small Lassioglossum, the Dialectus, um, if you're familiar with those. Uh, to, you know, the size of some of the Holictus species. So this is a photo of one of the larger ones. And then this is a male, uh, Spicotes, and the males tend to be a little bit darker. So frequently you're going to have red on the abdomen. Um, in males, you tend to get a lot more black creeping in, but the males look quite a bit like the females otherwise. Um, now we'll jump into the Megachylidae. So the family of leaf cutters and mason bees. Uh, this is Dioxys pacificus. Um, so these are closed cell and open cell parasites, depending on the species. And their hosts are kind of all over the place within the family uh, Megachylidae. So from the mason bees to the wool carter bees to the leaf cutter bees, um, all of those are potential hosts depending on the species. Um, by now, you may already be recognizing a little bit of a trend of this red abdo abdomen here. Um, and that's something that is seen pretty commonly throughout kleptoparasitic bees. And it may be, at least in part, um, in relation to the fact that these kleptoparasites um, are sneaking into a nest and they don't want to be caught. And bees are not able to see the color red as well. So red blends a little bit more into the background, so it may allow them to avoid detection a bit. Here's another species, Dioxys pomonae, a much, much smaller species. And there's a Dioxys in the natural environment. And again, not very hairy, um, but you can see the hairs that it does have um, are picking up pollen. So this is definitely serving as a pollinator. And here we have a Celioxys species. So if you've ever looked at these together, they look really similar. Um, they have some extremely similar features, uh, including a tapered abdomen, um, including these pointy axilla, which if you've tried to find these under the microscope at the B school, you might've struggled with that once or twice. Um, so very similar, but not closely related at, at all. So this is sort of an example of um, convergent evolution, at least in the sense of converging on this form. Um, these are mostly uh, hosts, uh, or mostly parasites of bees in the genus Megachylae, so the leafcutter bees, um, but they've also been known to um, parasitize some bees in the family Apidae. Really, really beautiful bees really distinctive. Um, if you see that flying around, you know what it is almost immediately. There are not many bees that look like that. And then the males don't look much like the females actually, so they don't have that tapered abdomen. They have uh, two pairs of teeth at the end of the abdomen instead, but otherwise look a lot like their relatives in um, the megachylae. So they kind of look like male leaf cutter bees.
So one of my favorite groups, the Stelis, um, it's a really uh, large genus. Um, we have quite a few species in our area. Um, I don't think you can really do much um, identification of them currently. Um, Link can maybe speak to that, but um, very taxonomically difficult. There aren't many keys. Um, and they tend to parasitize other amphidians. So these are in the tribe Amphidiini. So they're parasitizing wool carter bees. Um, and then they're, they've also been known to parasitize um, leaf cutter bees in the genus Megachile. Great thing is we can identify at least one species in our area. This is Stelis laticincta. It's the only member of the subgenus Dolichostelis um, in our area and it's super distinctive. So um, this is a female that I caught in my backyard. Um, and you know, if we're still stuck at home in July, go out in your backyard and look for these. I think they're um, reasonably common in the Willamette Valley. Um, and they're just gorgeous little bees. They're quite small, um, about six, seven millimeters. Um, and if you have goldenrod in your backyard, they love goldenrod. And then out in the real world, um, really pretty Stelis. So um, they can go from being kind of matte black. They almost all uh, have maculations on the body. So pale markings, um, or they can just be this kind of really deep metallic. So really, really pretty bees. This is Zeromelecta californica. So now we're moving on to the Apidae. So we've jumped families now. And if you recall, the Melectini were sort of basal in, um, or at least came from uh, this uh, basal origin of kleptoparasites in the Apidae. Um, they look to be somewhat closely related to their hosts, which are in the Anthophorini. Um, and I tend to find these around uh, high densities of Anthophora urbana. There it is out in the world. And we have Melecta pacifica. So all these bees you're probably seeing are, um, they just kind of look like villains, particularly like Star Wars villains. Um, these are all larval closed cell parasites. And then Melecta separata here. So these are really attractive bees. I mean, maybe that's only a face a mother could love, but I think they're pretty. Then we have uh, the Epiolini. So this is an Epiola species. Um, these tend to parasitize Coletes and look a little bit like rabbits with their antennae. Um, these are not very common bees. Uh, genus Triepiolus is a little bit more common. Uh, because they're, parasitize, they're parasites of some of the more common genera that we have in our area, like Melisodes um, and some of the Anthophora. Um, we don't see Epiolus too often. And I think this next one is actually the same species. I caught it at the same location. Um, I think there's just a difference in the level of wear on the specimens there. Um, that would be my guess at least, but I haven't taken a close look at them yet but really, really gorgeous bees. I think these are some of the, the prettiest bees just in terms of their um, really interesting hair patterns that are made by these oppressed white hairs. And then on to ones that um, are really the most common in our area, the nomada species. And that's partly because um, one of their primary hosts, the Andrina mining bees are also really common in our area. So we have a lot of different nomada species and they're wildly colored. Um, this one looks kind of like Ronald McDonald. Um, some are, you know, colored just like Spicotes, a black thorax and red abdomen. Some are all red, um, really beautiful bees. And we probably have quite a few species in our area, but they're really currently not um, identifiable to species level in most instances. So there's another example of a nomada. This one is almost all red. This is in Camus, uh, right around this time of year. 
And then here is another nomada species. And this brings us into our next um, little segment because if you look closely, you have some hangers on on this nomada species right behind the mid leg. So what these are are triangulin larvae of meloid blister beetles. And that's going to be the first non-bee kleptoparasite that we talk about. So meloid blister beetles uh, produce these triangulin larvae. And here's a really close up picture of one that um, kind of burrowed its way into the abdomen of this uh, sphicodes um, when I caught it. And you can kind of see just barely its head there, and there are the eyes. Um, so these are super weird. Uh, the larvae are free living and mobile. And then once they end up in a bee's nest, they actually kind of regress and become an immobile larva and develop um, more slowly kind of as a typical um, beetle grub would. Uh, but they start out um, living on flowers, waiting for a bee to come. They jump on a bee's back and they hope to catch a ride on that bee's back into um, the bee's nest where they hang out, they kill the bee larvae, and then they feed on the pollen provisions and develop into adult beetles. Um, this is an example of one, definitely not from our area, um, but this is the iron cross blister beetle uh, found in the American Southwest. This one was from Arizona but they all look pretty much like this. They have a small head, these really long, often distended abdomens. Um, and <clears throat> they're called blister beetles because they can emit a liquid um, that's pretty uh, toxic and can cause uh, blistering on human skin, um, which is probably also why in a good number of them, you see these bright colors, um, these aposomatic warning colors. So this is one that people are probably a little more familiar with. This is a jewel wasp in the family uh, Chrysididae. So these are pretty common um, nest parasites of uh, cavity nesting bees like mason bees and leaf cutter bees. Um, they're really obviously gorgeous. Um, what's really neat about them is, and this is uh, one in the genus Chrysura. Um, so one that does parasitize mason bees and leafcutter bees, and they have a um, concave abdomen so that if they're caught breaking into a nest, they can roll into a ball like a roly-poly and just have their really um, hard exterior facing um, the sting of the predator. And there have been reports of bees actually picking them up in their mandibles when they roll into a ball and just chucking them out of the nest. Um, and here's a picture of what that other end, the back end, looks like. Um, so super um, uh, kind of dense, um, really heavily armored, lots of spikes. Looks like something you wouldn't want to mess with. And then one of my favorites, um, these are bee flies. So these two are probably um, Bombylius anthophilus, uh, which is um, basically the same as the greater bee fly, Bombylius major, which is everywhere. Uh, but they tend to have more white fur on them and tend to be a little bit earlier in the year. Um, but basically the same thing. Most of the bee flies um, in the genus Bombylius are parasites in ground nesting bees. Um, and so how they do that is particularly fun. And here's a picture illustrating a part of that. So the females actually have this weird pouch on the underside of the abdomen, which they use their wings beating really fast to kick sand up into um, and that sand coats the eggs a little bit probably makes them harder to detect in a nest and then they'll go off and just throw eggs in anything that looks like a bee's nest so they've been known to um, lay eggs in the eyelets on uh, shoelaces on people's shoes any dark spot around the ground they're just shooting eggs at basically and they can lay um, you know hundreds a day sometimes but the idea is to lay them in the nests of um, ground nesting bees and particularly mining bees in the genus Andrina. And when they hatch, the larvae crawl into the nest and dispatch the egg or the larvae. Um, so it's basically from that point on the same as any other kleptoparasitic bee species. Um, but um, obviously not a bee. These are flies. 
Um, and they perform a lot of pollination services as well. Um, you can see on this one, she has quite a bit of pollen on her. Um, these are really common at some of our uh, spring flowers. Uh, rosy plectritis seems to be one of their favorites, um, but you can find them visiting buttercups, camas, uh, just about anything. Um, and they, there are flowers in our area that are uh, particularly pollinated by bee flies in the genus Bombylius. And I think, yeah, that wraps it up. So um, I'll stop my screen share and we can jump into some questions now. Okay, how, uh, how are we doing questions? Should I just read off the... Okay, yeah, I'll just read off the chat. So if you have a question for me, um, type something in the chat or uh, type like a question mark in the chat and then you, um, I'll call on you and you can turn on your microphone and ask the question that way. Um, that might work well too. You can also press the raise your hand button. The raise your hand button too. All of that works well. So how many kleptoparasites do you think are in the Willamette as far as cuckoo bees go? Like 10 species, 100 species? <laughs> Um, several dozen would be my guess. I mean, there are a lot of nomada, right? And then we have um, some triepiola species. Um, we have at least Molecta separata on the valley floor. Um, we have a lot of Spicotes. It's kind of, I mean, I, I would expect several dozen easily. Oh, let's see. Got the chat. Would you encounter them in urban? Oh, well, I'm, I'm jumping ahead. Hold on. Okay. How common are bumblebee cuckoos? Uh, a lot less common than um, many other of these kleptoparasites, but it kind of depends on where you are. So I've, I've never seen any in um, the Willamette Valley and in urban areas. I'm sure that they're around, I would assume, um, but they're going to be a lot less common. Um, and some of the other areas, uh, alpine areas maybe, where you have really dense bumblebee populations. Um, and then from Tom Mitchell, how does a queen bumblebee relinquish control of worker bees? Um, good question. <laughs> so there's, there's um, either physical intimidation or kind of chemical, well, probably a mix of, of um, pheromone expression too. Um, I really can't speak to the exact, um, details of that situation, uh, but it's a really interesting, um, it's a fascinating behavior. Uh, let's see. And Donies asking, would you encounter them in urban areas? Absolutely. Um, less frequently though, generally than you would in some more intact natural areas. Um, but that's going to be... Um, kind of dependent on just uh, the population of bees you have in your area. So I find kleptoparasites in my yard. Um, I found Celioxis, Stelis, Nomada. I found the, um, you know, the bee flies in my yard. I think that's about it for now, but hopefully, um, hopefully there's more to come. Uh, Tony's asking, what's the best way to find kleptos? Um, just put out something for them to steal. Um, any, anywhere that the bee populations are really, you know, abundant and dense, if you can find a nesting aggregation of Andrina or of Anthophora um, and have time to sit around and watch it, and who doesn't right now, um, you might find some. So you actually aren't as likely to find um, kleptoparasites looking on flowers as you are other bees, because you'll often just kind of catch them out, out of the corner of your eye, um, hovering several inches off the ground looking for a nest. Um, of course, they do visit flowers, and that's where you know, you'll see them a good chunk of the time. But a lot, I mean, several that I've caught have honestly been um, swiping my net at something else I saw flying across the ground and they happen to be flying across the ground at the same time. Um, so they're often just kind of flying around, checking things out. 
but anywhere that bee populations are really robust is a good spot to look. Uh, Stephanie Hazen, some of these bees look like wasps. How can you tell in the field if you're looking at a kleptoparasitic bee or a wasp? And that's a really good question. Um, part of it is just kind of feel for how they're acting. Um, you know, if they're visiting a flower, they're more likely to be a bee than a wasp. Of course, we know a lot of wasps visit flowers, um, but that's something that may kind of tune you into thinking this might be a bee. Um, there's just, there's something about their look. So they tend not to have uh, robust leg musculature as you would see in a lot of wasps of the same size. Um, they're often gonna have more hair than wasps, even though they don't have a lot of hair, they're often going to have more hair. So hair bands on the abdomen. Um, and then I feel like, you know, with the nomada particularly, some of their coloration is just not common among wasps in our area. You know, we don't see that many wasps that are all red. Um, we especially don't see that many wasps that are all red and then have some yellow spots on them. Um, so it's just kind of a mix of, of getting a feel for these little differences. Um, and then anytime you're seeing something flying really close to the ground, that looks like it's looking for something on the ground, um, that's something to keep an eye out for. Of course, spider wasps, which have some of that black and red color coloration do the same thing, but um, that's a behavior to keep an eye out for. August, I think some of the questions uh, came to me and you may not have seen them. One uh, came oh. from Olivia and she wanted to know if you had a favorite kleptoparasite. Okay. Um, favorite kleptoparasite. I don't know. I mean, I, I'll say something's my favorite and then the next picture I pull up, I'll say that one's my favorite. They're all pretty great. Um, I really like Molecta separata. That's one that I really like. I just find something about it to be really beautiful. Um, but they're all really, they're all really attractive. I mean, I think these are some of the most attractive bees. Um, they're just kind of sleek and mean looking. They look like, you know, they're like the Ferraris of bees, basically. Um, Could I interject a question here? You can, uh, yes. Let me lean forward so I can hear you. Okay. Um, so through the Oregon Bee Atlas, we've only received one or two specimens of dioxys. Yeah. So I'm curious um, if you, you must have seen a bunch, not, probably not hundreds, but you know, you've had the opportunity to observe them and you're familiar with the sites that you've seen them. So I'm curious if you can make a guess as to the hosts of um, some of the dioxys that you've seen just based on what you know is in the same area. So it would be a total guess um, but just based on really abundant taxa, um, Hoplitis fulgita, possibly. That would be the super abundant species at these areas. Um, yeah, I, I mean, just a guess, but that would be the first thing that, that comes to mind. <laughs> yeah, it's so, so many of these things are totally unknown. That... Yeah, until you see one going in a hole. <laughs> thank you yeah okay um emily sun has a question okay. um has a hypothesis about the red coloration acting as camouflage ever being tested yeah has it ever been tested i don't know do you know i don't know either <laughs> yeah i don't know um how do you test that i guess you could you could paint the bee a different color. I don't know. It seems like it would be a challenge to test, but um, I'm sure there's a way to do it. There's a good thesis there. Um, okay, let me look through the chat. Do we have any idea of the proportion of kleptoparasites and their hosts? Let's say of 100 hosts, how many kleptoparasites could we expect? Or is this not studied? That is a really good question and that has been studied in some instances. Um, now I, I can't put an exact number of uh, parasites to hosts, 
but I can tell you that the percentage of parasitized nests sometimes hits as much as like 90% in a colony where at least one nest cell has been parasitized. Um, so it can be super, super high. Um, of course, that at that point, that colony is potentially on the point of collapse um, or at least on a, you know, the upward end of the bell curve for those kleptoparasites and you're going to have a crash in that population um, probably, you know, in the following year or so. So those things um, go in cycles, but parasitism rates can be extremely high in some instances and then extremely, extremely low in other instances. I have another question. Okay. <laughs> uh, what do you know about Oreopasites in Oregon? Yeah, nothing. I would tell you if I did. Um, <laughs> So I didn't, I didn't include some of those like Oreopasites or Holcopasites or Neolara because like, I mean, I don't have specimens. Um, uh, Neopasites as well. Yeah. Yeah. So no, I, I don't know. Uh, in Oregon, we'll see, right? I don't think they've come in in the Atlas, right? One? So, so <laughs> I keep telling everybody this because I'm so excited, but yesterday I was going through... Um, one of Michael O'Loughlin's vein trap samples mm -hmm. um, from Ontario, I think. Okay. And it was full of Perdita. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure there's an Oreopasites in there. Nice. That'd be fun. Cool. It's like this big. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds about right. We've also um, had um, a small series of Neopasites come in from uh, Judy Maxwell from oh. the past team. And it, the species looks really similar to the one that I find in British Columbia that um, parasitizes the nests of Duphoria holocyania, which is the snowberry bee. Yeah, okay. But uh, other than that, I don't think we have any others. Yeah. All right, we have a few more. We've got a backlog of questions here. Bonnie wrote, do kleptoparasites tend to mimic the life cycle of their host? Or if parasitizing a species that only has one generation year, will the kleptoparasite oh, emerge later? Yeah, good question. Um, so they're going to be emerging at roughly the same time as their host because they're going to be in the same nest. Um, if you know if the kleptoparasite is at the top cell, maybe a little earlier, but there it's going to be pretty much in tune with everything else going on in that nest, um, just naturally. Uh, so yeah, they mimic their life cycle in terms of their flight period, um, and you know, different from how a flight period might have a mismatch with a preferred flower, um, you're not going to have that same mismatch with something living in the same nest. So there's less of a risk of phenological mismatch due to say climate change or something um because you're sharing the same nest um we have a question here from Lori. Lori, i'll unmute you hi can you hear hey, me hey Lori. hi so uh i found a piece of bamboo that appears to have some wool carter nest in it mm -hmm. could i uh put those in a jar or something and maybe catch a parasite out of that? You potentially could. Um, it just depends on if they've been parasitized. Um, mm -hmm. But I think, you know, I, I think possibly the Stelis laticincta that I have showing up in my yard parasitizes them. I'm not sure. Um, I just wonder about it because they're out around the same time. And in my neighborhood, there are a ton of Anthidium monocotum. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it's always fun to, to take a nest and if you have that opportunity to see what comes out of it. Uh, let's see. Judy, I think has the next question. Yeah. I don't know these names. Judy said we collected some airy Chorus? Your chorus last year. Yeah, there it is. Is, is this, this why we were look, asked to look for Macrodora this year? Oh, I don't know. That's a question for Link. Hmm? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> 
which B are, are, are they looking for? So um, we collected some Ericorus last year. Is this why we were asked to look for Macrodora this year? Ericorus. Ericorus. I don't know what that is. Maybe that's a typo. Okay, we'll see if uh, Judy will give you a chance to clarify. We'll go down the list. So um, it's possible that uh, Macroterra occurs in Eastern Oregon on Sphalacea. Sphalacea. Um, I do believe there's a single record um, that's available publicly online. Um, I, but I can Springs area. Much more than that. And Macroterra is kind of like a funky cousin of Perdita. And so it's not a, a cuckoo bee, but I would expect that they're likely parasitized by Oreophysites as well, which goes after Perdida and some other um, pander giants. Okay, uh, Stephanie Hazen asked, "What is a closed cell nest versus open cell nest?" Yeah, so um, closed cell parasitism is when a cuckoo bee goes into <clears throat> excuse me, a nest cell that has already been closed. So fully provisioned, the egg has been laid, that cell is closed. Um, whereas an open cell parasite is a parasite that goes into a nest cell that is still in construction, still being provisioned. The egg probably hasn't been laid yet. So closed cell parasitism was probably the basal state, at least for a big chunk of um, parasitic bees. And then they evolved open cell parasitism, um, and a change that occurs that allows open cell parasitism is a change in the larval stage to have mandibles that are able to kill the existing larvae or egg. Um, in adult closed cell parasitism, the adult can go in and destroy that egg or destroy the existing larvae. Um, so that's a, a big difference there. Oh, Carol wrote, could I share a photo of what may be one for confirmation? If so, how? Um, sure. Um, you could send it to um, my email, which I can just type into the bottom um, of the chat here. Oh, now I'm at the bottom of the chat. Now I have to, okay, let's see. I got okay, from Leanna. I've been seeing a lot of bee flies lately, especially hovering around mining bee nests. What is the long proboscis on the face of them? What is the function of that? Uh, it's just to make them look really cute. Um, it really, it's, it always stays extended. Um, unlike a lot of flies, they're not able to retract it at all. It's simply for feeding. So they're going to be going into um, a lot of flowers that have pretty long corolla tubes to access the nectar. Of course, they can access nectar on any of the open flowers like daisies and things like that too, um, but they're able to access nectar in pretty deep flowers. So as adults, all they feed on is nectar and a little bit of pollen. Um, and sometimes you'll see them wallowing in mud like insects do. Uh, Mark wrote, how do kleptoparasitic adults gain entry into the closed cells of their hosts via their ovipositor inserted into host cells or by breaking down host cell barriers? Good question. Um, both depending. So sometimes they just need to break in enough to extend the ovipositor into the cell and that's it. Um, but a lot of the times they're going to um, kind of be regurgitating nectar or spit if it's like a, a, a nest that's been sealed with mud um, so that they can make that pliable and then pull that away. And then they'll go in with their whole body, sometimes head first, if they're going to destroy the larvae or egg that's existing in there. Um, so they'll bite that um, and then they'll turn around and back in and lay an egg. So it's kind of a mix, it depends on um, the species. Uh, but yeah, um, pretty much the two options that you suggested there are how they do it. I have another question. Yeah, go for it. Is um, some sort of kleptoparasitism uh, 
equally as common among solitary wasps? Oh, I don't know that. I don't know that answer. Um, God, I'm trying to think. Just from what I've seen, I think that the wasps tend to use open cell parasitism, but that's only from what I've observed personally. Um, and that would be parasites of bees, so wasp parasites of bees. Um, of course, there are a ton of wasp parasites of wasps. Um, so I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I'd imagine it's really a mix. Wasps have had a, had a longer time to come up with all kinds of crazy things. There's a question from uh, Emi Ali. I'm sorry if I got your name wrong. Uh, would the presence of triangulin larva on bees also act as an indicator of bee community health? Yeah, um, so I would think so. Uh, has it been tested? I don't know. Um, but I would expect that any presence of kleptoparasites, whether those are bees, whether it's kleptoparasitic flies, or whether it's those mellowed blister beetles, that that's going to indicate that you have a healthy enough bee community to support um, parasitism, which is kind of what you need. And so if you find um, a lot of these parasites, generally you're going to have a higher abundance of bees and probably a higher diversity of bees as well. Um, I can say that, you know, in one spot that I go to every year, there's a massive outbreak of uh, blister beetle triangulum larvae all over bees and flowers about five years ago. And for the following few years, there was one species of mining bee that I just did not see in the same numbers again. And that was the one that had all these triangulum larvae on it. Um, and because of that, I was not seeing these triangulum larvae either. And then the last two years, I've started to see an uptick in both of those again. So it's probably somewhat cyclical. And if you're only using that as an indicator of community health, you know, for one or two years, um, you may be missing that indicator. It may be on the downslope of, of that cycle. Um, so it's good to look at kind of a bunch of different indicators and, um, you know, those triangular larvae could be one of those indicators. Uh, Stephanie Hazen asked, do all bees have their own kleptoparasite? Um, no, but, you know, kind of most do. Um, so it's really common. Now that doesn't mean that there's obviously a one-to-one -one relationship where um, there's a specific relationship between a kleptoparasite and its host and you know that kleptoparasite doesn't go to any other. Um, you don't have that as frequently or maybe at all except I don't know in the case of some of those macropus parasites um, things like that the really rare ones but uh, yeah most bees uh, have potential kleptoparasites. Okay. Uh, the answer to, uh, to Crystal, the answer to that is yes. Um, you, you're welcome to send me a couple photos to look at. Um, I threw my email up there, so you're welcome to send those and I can take a look. Um, happy to do that. I have a question. How do how do we get your book? How do people get copies of your book? Well, you you know the answer to that. I don't know the answer to that right now. Oh, okay. Well, I guess um, we. But is there a link? Do you have a link somewhere? I've got a link floating around, but do you, you don't have you don't have a link hosted. Or just somewhere. a digital copy? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I can. I'm trying to think. Um, I think you can, if the link isn't broken, you can go to the website. I just typed the link in. Um, you can go there. I think you can download it there right now. I'll, yeah. I'll check that after we get off and make sure that that's true. For those um, of you who are not in the Bobby, Atlas, uh, you're looking at doing more. Um, Argus has a really great book on uh, bees of the Willamette Valley. So if you don't know about it, um, it's uh, really worth uh, taking a look at. There we go. Okay, well, it looks like we are at the 
uh, top of the hour. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, there's a virtual cheer of uh, congratulations and uh, gratitude for your presentation. Thank you so much, August. Uh, thanks for having me. This was a lot of fun. Look forward to uh, the next one on April 30th. Which is going to be Lincoln Best. Our uh, moderator tonight is going to be talking about the Oregon Bee Atlas and some of the um, the great findings that they've had. You can uh, there's the URL below there that you can go to if you want to get the Zoom link. Uh, we will be uh, mailing it out widely. And uh, after that, we've got Cass Urban Mead, who some people will remember from a podcast we did. Cass uh, is studying uh, the bees in the canopies of hardwood forest in. Um, in upstate New York, she uses a massive slingshot to uh, uh, get her uh, get herself up into those canopies. So uh, it'll be a, it'll be a um, uh, we will launch you into um, the world of bees and trees. Okay. The, the other thing I will mention: uh, we will make the recording available uh, on the extension website. So if you want to go through some of these names a little bit slower or um, see these pictures, it'll be available to you. Uh, just go to the OSU Extension website, find the Oregon Bee Atlas, and um, uh, it'll be linked there. All right. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for coming out. Thanks, August. meeting.